Two more questions. Uh, I had a question about the uh, exhibit. <laughs> <laughs> I took it. Um, the exhibit, the Tony exhibit. Uh -huh. um, what happened to it after? Um, they're done with it, and do you consider it's afterlife? Uh, the stuff is, you know, is 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 pretty much um, not very usable. You know, it's just like anything else. And if this room gets changed, I don't know if they still figured out what to use, what to do with all these pieces in here. Um, we d we weren't given that as a criteria. Had we been given that as a criteria, we may have responded to, you know, maybe create. Uh, other things out of it, tabletops for schools or, you know, something else. But I mean, here you got four trailer loads of stuff that essentially goes into a dumpster. So when you think about today's green philosophy, it's not very green. Uh, do you create it with uh, uh, plastic laminate or do you create it with uh, uh, a paint that you could change something else to? If we create it with plastic laminate, it doesn't look like a disaster waiting to happen on site. Uh, but if we don't put the plastic laminate on there, we could use that stuff for something else. But I, I don't know if we've really taken, you know, I don't know, Josh, if you, in the shops that you worked at, whether anybody ever thought about any of that kind of stuff. I can't recall anything really that's just beginning to happen right now because there's just a tremendous amount of waste in some of these projects. But can you introduce your plan with a new criteria or just propose to them, hey, what don't you think about well, I think they'd be open for it now because it just makes them, gives them marketing, um, marketing points with their clientele that they've taken that kind of green attitude. It may, g you know, it may give us as a design firm uh, points to do s to take something a little more consciously like that. Um, what's uh, we really enjoyed? I really enjoyed the presentation. Thanks. And what's really impressive, I think, for this audience is the scale at which you work. And um, what I've been wondering is what's your philosophy or strategy for determining limits? I in terms of size, in terms of... Actually, this, the, what you've seen here is not even the biggest. Mm -hmm. there's, the, there's a museum that's about 75,000 square feet, children's museum that we did pretty much from soup to nuts, everything. And there's a 500,000 square foot theme park that we did in Tokyo. So. The philosophy that I have is take the scariest, next scariest project that you could possibly finagle yourself into and just sweat it out and, and deliver the goods. Mm -hmm. You know, don't do it. I mean, we've never taken, I mean, as I'm saying, as a 10 person firm to take a 500,000 square foot theme park, we don't know anything about dark rides. We don't know anything about all the contraptions that take all that stuff in there, but we take it on and we manage to, to survive. Uh, on that project that we take on a, a children's museum. Everything that I've ever done in design or this firm is doing, we, we try to finagle with the client to tell them. In fact, there's been certain projects that we were thought to be hired for something else. And they said, oh, by the way, we got this exhibit. We're, we're pursuing a signage program. We got this exhibit, 5,000 square foot exhibit. This was 15 years ago. And uh, we've never done one that big. It was not, not that huge, but it was big at that time. And I said, well, yeah, we'd like to submit that qualifications. And we did that, and we got that one. We didn't get the one we were chasing. So one of the reasons I went back to architecture school is because I was bored. And any time you get into a situation, that's what I find exciting about the mergers of these three disciplines, or even just industrial design, is that you can ch chameleon yourself to doing so many different things. You can be a package designer, you can be a uh, exhibit designer. I mean, just as an industrial designer, you can do all these various things that I showed here without going back to school for architecture, without going back to school for graphic design, finding the right partners to work with. You can do so many different things and you can reinvent yourself every step of the way. One, one time we're doing a story about a medical institution, next time we're doing a story of two by fours. I mean, how different can that be? You know, you just, you just find those crazy opportunities lying out there and we uh, enough people that we've developed over the 30 years that we've been in business know how crazy we are to take these opportunities so they bring these things to us and they say well, how would you like to handle this kind of thing I got a friend a call from me he said, a friend of mine he said that we worked with him on a small project and he says I've got this 500,000 square foot theme park in Tokyo it's in the basement of the Alps 
And I thought, hmm, this is weird. Uh, it, they built the Alps on top and we got the basement underneath the Alps. And, uh, and I said, no, we'll, we'll, we'll take that on. So it's just, I think, that's what, that's what I think has made it exciting for us. The weirder, the, the more challenging, the scarier, the better actually. It, when things go so smooth and we're doing things that we know uh, what we're doing every step of the way, that's, that, that's the point I went back to architecture school. I was bored. I knew exactly what the program was, we're going to do this, this, and that, and it was just wasn't exciting anymore. So I think that's the, that's the opportunity you have as an industrial designer, is you can, you can be doing so many different things. Last one. <laughs> Last one. Well, in that in that Mayo Clinic that I was telling you, there were uh, and uh, and the other one was uh, Wycliffe, the WordSpring project. When we looked at um, uh, at Mayo Clinic, we had a much better budget to work with. So we looked, we we brought in an acoustic designer that uh, we were able to design a very uh, effective ceiling plan, but also from the sound standpoint. As I'm speaking right now, or someone is speaking, let's say I've got a media right here, and it's speaking at the same intensity level that I'm speaking right now, this sound element that we had was essentially the size of that two by two ceiling tile, but it had like a two degree draft of sound. So it comes in here, I can hear it at this uh, level of decibels, but you can't hear it. It's just kind of, it's kind of a bizarre, uh, technology, but we look at how we can use some of that if it's affordable. In this case, we could afford it, so we used it. And then, uh, how do you manage sound absorption in a space when you've got a lot of hard surfaces? We need to look at that. And then, how do you manage uh, lighting? How do you manage uh, distraction of lighting? For example, if there's a uh, if 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 I'm speaking right now in this room and there's a window right there. Uh, you're not going to be focused on this, you may be focused on some puppy out there on the lawn. So you got to be careful on how, how you handle that aspect too. Okay. Well, thank you so much.